Welcome back to State of Belief Radio, everyone. I'm Welton Gaddy. Can you imagine building a life, career, and ministry on a religious vocation that you one day realize has become an empty performance? Can you imagine spending years as a faith leader only to realize you no longer possess the faith that you espoused? A vitally important resource for men and women facing this seemingly impossible situation is the Clergy Project, an organization that works to support and encourage individuals going through the very experience I just described. And I'm very pleased to welcome Catherine Dunphy, Executive Director of the Clergy Project, to State of Belief Radio. Catherine, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Would you please describe how the Clergy Project came about and the kinds of individuals that come to you for help? Well, the Clergy Project came about um, through kind of a collection of, uh, of ways. So uh, we had uh, several different founders. Um, the first was uh, conversations that went on between Dan Barker from the Freedom From Religion Foundation with uh, Richard Dawkins about the dilemma of being a pastor or a religious leader who's lost their faith. Mm-hmm. Um, the second major way that um, it was developed was through a research study out of Tufts University between Daniel Dennett and Linda Lascola. The Tufts study was called Preachers Who Are Not Believers. And that was really where a large pool of the members for the clergy project uh, came from. So it was founded in March 2011. So it's just over two years old. (laughs) And we were founded with 52 founding members of the clergy project, of which I am one of. Um, And so the the idea was to create a forum, um, a private um, password protected forum, where members uh, could talk about what it's like to go through this struggle of uh, losing your faith and then moving out of ministry and into, you know, the wider world. Right. I remember the um, the research project well, and and the interest that I had in it uh, when it was released. As I recall, that project focused on about five people or six people, something like that. And obviously, it made me wonder how many people do you estimate are going through this kind of traumatic change. Well, we don't really have any firm estimates on that. It is something that we we would like to look at. I mean, in the last two years, we've been we basically tried to just hit the ground running um, and create this little community. And we've only really started taking applications uh, to the project since uh, last uh, October 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we don't we we've grown from 52 to nearly 500 in in that, in that period of time. Um, and we've done very little by way of promoting our existence aside from, you know, talking to um, members of the uh, the media like yourself, um, but not a lot, a large scale promotion or anything along those lines. It's really mostly been uh, word of mouth. But it seems that people are finding us, they're discovering us uh, on their own. And, and, and right now, that's really, uh, we're really quite happy that it's, it's working out or unfolding in that way. Um, I would hope that in the future we'd be able to make an estimate or have a, a more thorough study to to say what we think the trends will be um, in this area. So, Catherine, when you say uh, that you started with 52 and you're now up to 500, uh, these these are people who have been through that experience. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's not just people interested in helping such individuals. Yes. It's those individuals. Yes, it, the, the, the helpers, if you will, or uh, the volunteers that help screen um, new applicants, uh, that help set up programs that are on our board of directors, they are all members of the clergy project. And we, we have that as a requirement because it's such a sensitive issue and people need to, need to have their anonymity protected, particularly if they're still active and trying to work their way out of being in a, a religious leader. So um, we're very cognizant of, of, of privacy um, and the need to um, untangle yourself 
from from uh, your job and and all of the all of the kind of cascading things that happen when you make this type of life change. You know, it doesn't it doesn't just happen in isolation. Uh, it it impacts their family. It impacts their community. Uh, it impacts their employment and self esteem. So so there's that several. It's it's not unlike many other types of discernment processes and and not unlike going through i would say maybe a divorce or a death mm-hmm. i uh, as you know am interested in uh, interreligious uh concerns and i'm curious uh, are there uh, several faith traditions uh represented among the the 500 or do most of these come out of one of the uh, uh, Christian denominations, or is it a is it a factor that you're finding across the the usual boundaries of religious leaders? Well, we do have it is interfaith. We uh, and it's been pretty much like that from the beginning. Um, it is predominantly a Christian phenomenon, but I think that's part and parcel of the fact that it, the clergy project was created in the United States, and the United States is a predominantly Christian nation, or the people in the United States are pre- predominantly Christian. Um, so, but we do have representation from uh, uh, active and former rabbis, as well as active and former imams. And we recognize, uh, I believe we also have... Um, of a high religious leader as well. So we, we're cognizant of the fact that we want to be pluralistic, uh, that we would like to welcome uh, uh, religious leaders from other faith traditions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, my uh, assumption was that uh, this is a human phenomenon and it would stretch across all traditions. And I'm, I'm really okay. glad to hear you say that you're, you're open to that. Mm-hmm. Um, Catherine, I don't actually know how to ask this question, so I may stumble through it, but how how long does it take for an individual to move from, and, and you're going to know the steps much better than I, but move from uh, questions and dissatisfaction within a tradition to being... Um, to, to entertaining doubt about that tradition, and then finally crossing the line between doubt and just saying, I, I just don't believe that. Is that well, a lengthy process, or how, yeah. or is it individual? I, how is that? I, I would say, by and large, the majority of the members of TCP had a very long process when it came to um, losing their faith um, and identifying as a non-believer. It wasn't, it's, for the vast majority of members, it's not something that was kind of like a light switch moment, right? There have been a couple who, um, when, you know, particular confronted with particular facts, said, that's it, I don't believe anymore. But for the vast, vast majority, it was a long, arduous discernment process where they, you know, constantly looked at uh, the arguments for and against, um, for myself included. I, I, I went through several years of, you know, reviewing where I was as an individual and my relationship to my um, to my church community, um, and it took me probably three to four years. And I would say that it takes most members at least that amount of time. That I I, I see, and I, and the reason I asked the question is also then to segue to this question. I would think. I mean, I know what it's like uh, to struggle with questions I can't answer, or I know what it's like to uh, doubt some things that. Uh, I don't feel like are absolutely critical for me to affirm to to do what I do, but I know what that takes out of a person. And if if you're in a situation with people looking to you for uh, religious leadership and you're struggling with the source uh, for which that leadership is is supposed to be attached. It's bound to take a, a toll through anxiety and depression and self, uh, uh, maybe even self-negation. Uh, so when people get to you, are they pretty well 
exhausted, uh, I guess is the word? Yes, I would say by and large, um, you know, people are, are, are there. Well, first, they're really thankful. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think I need to articulate that because they're so happy that they have found a community. Um, And when you're dealing with uh, religious leaders, you're dealing with people that like community and like that context and see the value and support um, and energy that uh, uh, is encouraged in those types of, uh, uh, in that way. And so generally people are really, really happy that they know they have peers, that they're not alone. Uh, that's usually the first thing that's articulated. And then it's, you know, this is what I'm struggling with. And that, that is the really um, wonderful thing about the, the Clergy Project's private forum is that here is a place for you to you know, articulate everything that you're enduring, the, the pain, the suffering, the, the challenges of communicating your, your change in worldview. Um, and you have um, a community of peers who, who understand that process. And mm-hmm. I think that that, that, helps, to, um, that helps to encourage um, and it, um, it helps to um, uh, alleviate some of the stress uh, that, that the members are facing. Um, but we, we've also been able to plug into other resources. For example, um, Recovering from Religion um, founder, uh, Dr. Daryl Ray, uh, invited members of the Clergy Project who are in need of, of counseling to, to take part in the uh, Therapist Project. So there's free therapy services available to, with anonymity for Clergy Project members who are experiencing uh, a high level of stress um, around these issues. Mm-hmm. Are there other uh, services that you want to mention? I mean, I think that what you've just said absolutely would be basic. Are are there other services that the Clergy Project offers? Yes. um, We, well, (laughs) we've just done, uh, been able to offer uh, an employment assistance uh, grant. Uh, So uh, through the... um, through a new a new program that was funded by uh, Todd uh, Stiefel and the Free Thought and his Free Thought Foundation. Yeah, Todd's um, been on this they, show, by the way, so the people yeah. know who you're talking about. Great. Yes. Yeah. So so Todd um, um, uh, uh, helped us to uh, you know create and you know helped us to net, uh, to come up with. Uh, this this program utilizing the services of an outplacement company, so that they can this company will assess the skill set of our mem- of a member who is going through the program, help them with testing, uh, update their resume, do uh, interview prep, all the resources and things that they would need in order to make themselves stand out as a as an appropriate candidate for a job outside of a ministry. Um, and so it's been a really um, important program because. Clergy persons have a, a tremendous amount to offer outside of active ministry. Um, when you think about how much um, a, a pastor or a priest or a minister does when it comes to operations of a, of a, of a congregation, uh, many of those skills could be translated into community development, into operations in a nonprofit, into um, particular you know levels of government. So, so there are a lot of skills that are there that can be translated, but it does take a you know, some sort of process in order to communicate that value to someone outside of ministry. It is such a an immensely personal and, and I'm sure painful area of one's life to uh, have to reflect on and deal with and then uh, find transition from. Uh, you're the executive director of the Clergy Project, but you're also someone who has lived through this experience, as you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you mind talking about your own experience? Sure. I can uh, give you a, a little bit of, of background about my experience. Um, I would say that um, my experience, even though it was tremendously, I found it very challenging and, and spent quite a lot of time in discernment and trying to understand where I was, where I was and where I wanted to be. Um, at the time that I made the transition um, and let go of my face and, and and started to identify as a non-believer, I didn't have a, a lot of uh, familial expectations um, on me. I didn't have a family to support. Um, but for me, I was um, a Roman Catholic chaplain uh, working, uh, doing hospital work, community care. Um, and I was actually just finishing my master's program when I 
had the what felt like a light bulb moment, but re what really was uh, spending eight years studying theology, um, mm -hmm. where I would I recognize that I didn't actually believe these things, <laughs> that it wasn't how, how I saw myself. Yes, there were values that I saw articulated that resonated with me, but the 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 doctrines, the statements of faith, they they felt hollow for me, um, mm -hmm. and I felt that you know, the, the ideals that I aspire to were more of the humanist um, persuasion. And so after going back and forth and trying to do my job and <laughs> trying to finish my program, I just came to a place where it felt like it just broke. And at the time, it was quite challenging. And even in some ways, it still remains. So it was navigating the personal relationships, particularly with my um, my mother and my siblings, um, because my mother is a, a you know at the time that I was graduating um, with my MDiv, my mother was actually working as a missionary in a developing nation, and so I come from a long, <laughs> very many priests and nuns in my family, and actually. Part of the reason I studied theology was because I, I was at the door of the convent when I was 18. And they, the mother superior said to me that I should go and study theology before I entered, before, so, I could make a, you know, so I could make a better decision. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was very difficult to, to stand there and say, well, uh, you know, I love and respect you, but I no longer value uh, this as this in my life, um, uh, especially when my entire family kind of felt like it, um, you know, orbited the church. Yeah. When you were going through that, did you have any resources uh, even similar to what the Clergy Project offers that you could turn to at that time? I had nothing. <laughs> it was a pretty... Um, I, it was a pretty alienating experience um, to uh, feel like I had made, changed my worldview and that there was no one that I could speak to about, pardon me, about it. Um, and I just kind of, I felt like I kind of s snuck off <laughs> and lost ties. Um, and, and maybe part of that was me me not, you know, self-alienation. Um, mm -hmm. but I felt that I was, there was, there was something wrong with me. I just, the idea that kept, you know, I kept rolling over in my brain was how could I go through this much study and this much work in theology and then turn out, and I don't believe any of it. I'm an mm -hmm. atheist, and, but that's just who I am. You know, this, that's just how I think. And that's mm -hmm. just what I believe. Um, and so it, you know, I just kind of sat with it and was quiet with it for quite a long time. Um, and I think, believe it or not, um, the time I spent on retreat <laughs> yeah. helped me a great deal in, in discerning how I truly felt about it and, sure. and, uh, and, and where I wanted to go from there. But I didn't have any resources, nothing to plug into. I had to go and make a new career with the degrees that I had. I had to network. I had to push my own boundaries. Um, and I was lucky that I had the flexibility to do that at the time. Yeah. I would say that for most members of the clergy project, that is not the case. They do not have that flexibility. They have family obligations aside from, you know, the, the pain and suffering that their that their change in worldview will might or will most likely inflict on their family members. Mm -hmm. They they don't have the ability to kind of roll with the punches and all of a sudden find a new career. And so that's what makes t the clergy project so important. I have two very important questions to ask in about two minutes left. So I need you <laughs> to be succinct, yeah. though it's unfair. Yeah. There's very possible that someone is listening to this program who's going through that kind of crisis. What would you say to that person? I would say that uh, they should reach out. Um, they should contact us um, and uh, talk to some of our screeners. Um, and, you know, if, if the clergy project is not the right fit for them, 
um, say they are, you know, don't consider themselves to be non-believers, um, then there are other resources that I would recommend, such as recovering from religion, um, or also possibly talking to someone through the uh, therapist project. So I would say contact us, because we would like, even if, it, you know, this isn't the community for you, we want to we, we want to do what we can to help you. So please visit our website then at clergyproject.org. I think equally important, uh, maybe even more complex, what would you say to the people surrounding that clergy person, friends, family, congregation? What do they need to know? I would say that the person that you love and know is still the same person. Their worldview has changed, and it is a, it's their you know, personal perspective. They most likely don't want to change your position. They don't want to um, have you migrate your beliefs away from how you believe. They only want you to remember to continue to embrace them, uh, continue to see them as the person that you love, uh, because those things have not changed. Excellent. Just excellent. Catherine Dunphy is executive director of the Clergy Project, a unique organization providing support and assistance to faith leaders who find themselves no longer believing in the message they were obligated to preach. More information is available at clergyproject.org. Catherine, your work is merciful and demonstrates a profound commitment to courage and integrity and truth. Uh, thank you for sharing this information with us. Uh, we all need to be aware of it, but if there are people who needed to hear your invitation, uh, even more so, we're grateful. So thanks so much for being with us today on State of Belief Radio. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the good work you do in interfaith dialogue.